Happy Thursday, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. I am Jeremy Birmingham. That is Andrew Ellis. This is Talking Stuff, the Ohio State Recruiting Podcast on the podcast. I just said the podcast three times in about 15 seconds, Andrew, and it makes me wonder, do you think you could say the podcast 10 times in 10 seconds? Yes, absolutely. Okay, go. The podcast, 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 the podcast. I wasn't counting, but that felt like 10. Yeah, I think it was. Uh, well done. You were, you win nothing, but uh, you do at least feel satisfied that you were able to accomplish it. Um, and uh, we're just going to dive right in to, to talking about stuff here on the podcast because it's Thursday. There's football on. People are doing things. This is a pre-recorded version because I'm getting ready to travel to New Jersey on so doing things a little bit early, but uh, we're going to start with Ohio State's first uh, bit of business this week, and that's the offer to Carlin Jones, the Arkansas, Arkansas, what the hell, uh, what the hell, Nebraska, um, a defensive line commit. He's from Texas. He is a six foot three, 290-pound defensive tackle prospect, uh, three-star according to Rivals.com. I think he's a consensus four-star across the, the, the networks. Um, and the first thought, that anyone has when Ohio State offers another defensive tackle prospect is what the hell? Where are the defensive ends? And I think this is really stemming from a place, Andrew, where Ohio State is looking at their current roster and beginning to wonder uh, how many of their first five defensive linemen on the current roster are actually going to be back for next season. And I think that the offer to Carlin Jones, especially when you team him up with um Edric Houston and Justin Scott and Eric Mensa, it gives a sense that the Buckeyes realize that they're going to need to really restock in the middle of this defensive line ASAP. Yeah, I think the the defensive line class is going to be bigger than what we anticipated way back when, and really bigger than I anticipated even as recently as a couple couple weeks ago. But when you look down the depth chart and you look at, you know, Tyleek and Mike Hall and those guys who could be gone and you factor in some of the attrition that could be coming um, to the NFL draft primarily, I guess, you know, it, it makes sense. And I don't know a ton about this kid. I know he's, you know, defensive tackle type. I know I've seen some Nebraska chatter where many people think this is like their favorite commit in the Nebraska class. So I'm not going to complain about it too much, but I think the initial thought is what does it mean for Justin Scott or whoever else? And the answer probably is very little, if not nothing at all. Yeah, I mean, if you're trying to prognosticate what it means for anyone, it's what does it mean for Tyleek Williams and Michael Hall and maybe even Ty Hamilton. Like, there's some discussion about all three of those guys heading off and trying the NFL. Um, you know, and people may scoff at that and say, "Oh, well, Michael Hall doesn't have big numbers and Ty Hamilton is playing part time." But like, that doesn't matter when kids have been in the program. They think they have a shot to go prove it in the NFL. And especially for someone like Ty Hamilton in this world of like the NIL money, like he's not making a buttload of money NIL wise. And so even if he's a fifth round pick, it's a better choice for a lot of kids than, than going back to school. So um, I, I think that this is where you look at an offer like this to Carlin Jones. Um, he wasted no time, much like Amaris Williams. We'll talk a little bit more about him in a second, but uh, Carlin Jones wasted zero time setting up an official visit to Ohio State. He will be in town uh, for the November 11th game against Michigan State. I talked to him on Wednesday, and he basically told me that it, why why would he not at least look to see what Ohio State has to offer? And to me, that's a pretty good indicator that this is a, a kid who's pretty smart. Uh, I know he, he he loves the Nebraska staff and is, enjoys um, you know what they have to offer and, and looks at Nebraska and thinks he's got an opportunity to make some impact there. But uh, if, if Ohio State calls, it's a different thing. Yeah, but you mentioned the quick turnaround time from offer to scheduling the visit, and I think that's probably pretty telling as far as how this one may end up going here in the next couple of weeks after that visit. Um, but again, not a kid I know a lot about, but just the the way this is all kind of moving so quickly kind of makes me feel like it might be safe to start penciling him into the class. So that's just my thought. Yeah. And this is where like NIL, again, I mean, talking about it with Ty Hamilton, but this is where it gets a little bit interesting in the in the efforts for a team at the top of college football's food chain like Ohio State to recruit against a team trying to get there. Nebraska, as you mentioned, like a guy like Carlin Jones may be more highly valued by Nebraska because that's where they're having to go. Uh, Ohio State obviously has Edric Houston in the class and Justin Scott. And so 
like you do look at it and say, well, maybe Nebraska can afford or is willing to be a little bit more aggressive with a kid like this in the NIL space than Ohio State would be because Ohio State has allocated most of their resources to Justin Scott or Edric Houston. So I think this is where in this new world of college football, we do have to at least look at it from a perspective of saying, well, this could be a, a factor. But the fact is, the fact is about this factor is that he has quickly decided to get to Ohio State for a visit and he's bringing his whole family. Um, and that does mean a lot. Now, what's interesting about this to me is like Amaris Williams, who did visit Ohio State for the Penn State game, uh, he's going to be in town for the Michigan State game on November 11th. And guess what? Amaris Williams is going to be there for that too. Uh, he's coming back for an unofficial visit to Columbus. It's a big opportunity for Larry Johnson to, um, you know, make sure that any of the the smoke that was coming out of the official visit gets restoked a little bit, and and you play with the 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 embers a touch because he is visiting Florida this weekend, and there's a visit to Tennessee afterwards for Amaris Williams. So two visits in three weeks for him is a pretty big deal if you're uh, keeping score at home. Yeah, and we said this a couple of weeks ago, but it certainly doesn't feel like the Florida side has got the warm and fuzzies about that one. So I don't know if that's going to lead to good news for Ohio State or good news for Tennessee or one or the other, but that uh, that Michigan State weekend is kind of shaping up to be kind of sneaky big. So, I mean, we'll talk more about that when the time gets closer, but I like the way that's uh, shaping up. Yeah, I mean, right now you have the Amaris Williams visit. You have the visit now from Carlin Jones. You have... The visit from Chance Robinson, uh, the official visit, uh, all of a sudden that's shaping up to be kind of the, the the weekend where you're looking to put the finishing touches on 2024. Um, you know, and if you're Ohio State, you're still on high alert for a little bit of chaos in in the mix of in the midst of things, um, primarily because of the the buzz, the hype now around Jordan Lyle and Miami. So let's dive into that a little bit. Uh, he visited the Hurricanes last weekend. Obviously, Coral Gables right down the road from uh, Fort Lauderdale, where he stars at St. Thomas Aquinas. Close friends with Chance Robinson, the aforementioned wide receiver who's visiting Ohio State on the 11th. Um, lots of buzz in the last couple days about Jordan Lyle and Miami. Uh, nothing has happened yet uh, at time of recording this, and so we need to be um, aware that there is at least some concern from the Ohio State side, but they're not conceding, and they're certainly not going to walk away from Jordan Lyle, who they believe is a difference maker uh, nationally, and that's why the Buckeyes recruited him when they did and took a commitment from him when they did. So it feels like an irritant, I think, like especially when you consider the Mark Fletcher decommitment and flip to Miami a year ago. But uh, this is what happens when you recruit in South Florida, right? Like you have to sort of expect that this is going to eventually uh, become a conversation. Yeah, took some trips to Florida State maybe too, I think. But yeah, my, Miami, he's just been a regular visitor there. And I, I saw some chatter on the forum about how he's the RB2 in Ohio State's class behind James Peoples. And I I have a bit of a different take on that. Maybe it's because Peoples has been banged up this year. But I think I, I think Jordan Lyles may be the most underrated guy in the class. So I do not like these recent developments. And I'm hoping that Tony Alford is able to uh, keep him in the mix. So it's going to be an interesting few yeah. weeks on that one. What's fascinating to me is that I assume, or or I believe it is assumed, that people are figuring Miami's ploy here, or pitch, is to say, well, Ohio State has Sam Williams-Dixon committed, and they've got James Peoples committed. Miami has two running backs committed outside of this as well. So it, it it's not a scenario where there is a, a stark difference in the opportunity to get to the playing field. The, the running back that Miami has in their class, uh, the, the top one is from Alabama, a really good player that the Buckeyes like. We had an offer from Alabama and, and Auburn, whose name is escaping me right now. But um, Hill? No, it's Kevin no. something. Riley? Um, Kevin Riley, I think, yeah. Uh, I think that's the name. Uh, he's a really good player. Ohio State liked him quite a bit. When they were um, evaluating running backs in the spring, he was a guy that I kept hearing about from, from the Buckeyes side of things. So um, it's not like Miami doesn't have commitments at running back. This is a situation where obviously NIL plays a role. Miami is desperate to make sure that top players from the biggest schools in that area stay home and, and go to Miami. Um, it's also just a scenario where as we get closer to signing day, as happens every year, kids who are committed to Ohio State that live further away, the 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 itch to, to stay closer to home, the worries about should I leave home, start to uh, amplify. And so I think that that's part of this as well. But um, it, it is interesting. I mean, it, 
Jordan Lyle was at Ohio State for the November or the October 21st game against Penn State. So it's not like there hasn't been com- communication or contact or visits. So um, it's just the, the fact that Miami is so close. It's just a constant barrage down there. Um, that that the Buckeyes are trying to fight against, and that that puts Tony Alford in a precarious position, which is why he it seemed like the Buckeyes that they did the same thing a year ago, where like, okay, you're our guy. We're not letting anybody else. We're not going to fiddle around with you. We're not going to you know ask you to wait. We're not going to hold off. Like you're our guy. We're taking your commitment, and you hope that that sort of loyalty from the Ohio State staff gets rewarded six months down the road, but. When you get closer to signing day, things seem to get uh, weird. Yeah, and Miami, Miami's having a pretty good season. I mean, they're what six and two, I think, right now. I know they had that terrible collapse against Georgia Tech or whatever it was, but yeah, I mean, they should um, be seven and one if they didn't have that dumbest play of the season. So, right, I, I do think it's interesting that last weekend, uh, you know, Chance Robinson was kind of recruiting him to Miami, and now Robinson is supposed to be in Columbus, possibly for the Michigan State game. So, there's just some interesting factors at play with that recruitment. So we'll, we'll see if Tony Alford can keep that one going strong. Yeah. And it's, um, it is a scenario where the Buckeyes again, do have two running backs committed um, outside of uh, Jordan Lyle. Sam Williams Dixon is not a guaranteed running back. There is still some discussion about him potentially playing defensive back, but I think he'll get his first crack at, at running back. And then you have James Peoples, as you mentioned, who has been banged up throughout most of his senior season. The question becomes if Jordan Lyle does end up decommitting from Ohio State, do they immediately get back in the boat and look for somebody else in the class of 2024, or do they just spin forward to 2025, um, a class where they were already considering two backs, um, and then that loss of Lyle would almost guarantee that you need two backs, which then puts you in a worse spot for players like Jordan Davison or Marquise Davis or whatever nationally. So that's where things get a little bit wonky if if you're Tony Alford in Ohio State. But again, the goal is to keep Jordan Lyle committed uh, and make sure that he signs with the Buckeyes in, in December. We'll see how that plays out. I'm not entirely uh, getting the warm and fuzzy optimistic vibes, but that's recruiting in the big city. Um, we are kind of buzzing through this show because, like I said, there's stuff going on in the world and uh, we're just trying to touch Touch points, key touch points, Andrew, for what's been going on. Uh, and we'll jump back a week to Eli Lee committing to Ohio State last Wednesday. We did not do a talking stuff a week ago because of travel plans and stuff like that. And uh, Ohio State not having a home game the weekend, it was felt like we could um, get through to this week. Uh, Eli Lee committed. He visited for the Penn State game. He told me after that game he wanted to spend a little bit more time talking to Jim Knowles and James Laurinaitis that day. Didn't get a chance to. I think if he had, he would have committed on the spot or, or the next day. Um, but then he got home and had his opportunity to reconnect with them and decided, why wait? And the Buckeyes are going to take probably three linebackers in the class of 2025. They had all of their co- the key linebacker targets on campus on that Penn State afternoon. So you had Justin Hill. You had Madden Faramo from California. Uh, you had Eli Lee. And you had uh, Elijah Melendez from Florida. The only guy you didn't have is TJ Alford, who's expected to visit for the Michigan State game. So, like, it was intentional to have all those guys together and to have them kind of conversating and getting to know each other. But it, what I think is most interesting is that of that group, Eli Lee is the one that is unranked. Obviously, he's, he's one that is currently not ranked by any national site, but. Uh, he is not going to, I think, scare anybody away nationally, probably because of that. So it doesn't change a lot of the plan from here. Elijah Melendez, I think, is is very close to committing to Ohio State. He told me that he wants to make a return visit for the Minnesota game with his mother. If that happens, I could see him pulling the trigger by the end of November. And then things get a little bit you know, chaotic because the Buckeyes will have an opportunity to to really narrow in on who the final piece of that class is. Some discussion about Justin Hill, as always, as you know, as an Ohio kid at Winton Woods. What I think is fascinating about that recruitment, Andrew, is that Ohio State sees him like in the Jack role, but they're not really playing the Jack position this year. So, how do you recruit a kid for a position you don't play, or do you tell the kid we're not playing that position because we haven't recruited anybody for it? Like, how do you mix? You know, how do you get there? 
yeah, that could be a situation where he sees himself as a better fit as the um, the Will Anderson type at a school like Alabama or something like that. Maybe I don't know. I'm probably getting ahead of myself a little bit there, but yeah, that's an interesting one. I mean, Eli Lee. I think as soon as he was offered, we kind of had a uh, countdown going on of this one's going to happen soon. It was just a matter of when he was going to pop. Um, they wouldn't have offered an in-state kid if they didn't feel like he was good enough to be in the class. Uh, they've had some weird stuff that's gone on over the years at Akron Hoban. So not a bad idea to get into, uh, get back into the good graces at a power program like that. Going to be a big linebacker class. And it sounds like a couple more could be one or two could be close here soon. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. I, I really like Eli Lee. I mean, he's six foot three, 220 pounds. A very instinctual player, plays at one of the best programs in the country at Akron Hoban, um, certainly one of the best in the state. And he's a kid that, you know, when when people talk about Ohio State recruiting and what are you looking for? Do you want kids that love Ohio State and that like breathe Buckeyes? Like that is Eli Lee. This is a kid that is born and bred Ohio State, loves everything about the Buckeyes and is the type of player that you know you're going to get four or five years out of. And that's the important thing. Sometimes you need guys who are going to develop a little bit. The, the comparison has been made multiple times to Tommy Eichenberg. Um, I think that's incredibly fair but looking at the film as a junior. And we'll see how he continues to grow as a senior. But I think that if you're Ohio State and you've got four commitments in the class of 2025 now, you have Javen Boggs and uh, Tavian St. Clair on defense. Uh, you have uh, on offense and on defense, you have Blake would be at corner, and now you have Eli Lee at linebacker. It's a good starting point. It's nice to have kids who are close to home uh, as your your ringleaders in the 25 class, and that's what Eli Lee will do with Tavian St. Clair. So overall, uh, it's not an unexpected commitment, and certainly if you listen to the episode of Bermanology I did with Eli Lee 10 days before his commitment, like it shouldn't have been a major surprise to see that coming. So don't want to like dismiss it and say, oh, not important because it certainly is. But uh, for Ohio State, it is, it's the a key piece in the class of 2025 because those types of commitments, you just want to knock out early. You don't want to have to worry about those six months from now. Uh, you don't want Penn State, you know, in the spring to be able to be like, oh, well, hey, you know, Ohio State's not prioritizing you. Why don't you come here uh, or something like that, which is certainly the way that could have gone in a different, you know, world. So, um that's really the main topics for this episode of Talking Stuff. So, Andrew, we're going to just dive into the four-minute offense and let you just uh, let it off your chest. What's what's on your mind? You look tired, my friend. You look. I am tired. tired. Had a long day, but we're good now. Um, so, you talked about like early pieces for 2025. I know um, Carter Lowe, who's from your old stomping grounds, the Toledo area. I think he put out a top. Was it a top five this week? Five. Top yep. five power programs. What was it? OSU, Michigan, Georgia, Bama, and somebody Tennessee. else on there. Tennessee. Yeah. Do you, um, you know, sometimes when those top lists comes out like that and it's four or five, as opposed to like 40, that could signify something's come in. And I know we've chatted before in the past about maybe that one does happen a little sooner. Is there, do you think that one could pop in the next few weeks or month or what? What's that look like? I don't know if it's the next few weeks. I wouldn't be surprised if it's by end of this year, you know, like end of this calendar year, um, which is now eight weeks. Even that I think would be sooner than people would have believed six months ago. Uh, it's clear cut to, to Carter Lowe and his family. The Ohio state has prioritized him uh, far greater than anyone else has. It, you know, but he did visit Michigan two weeks ago. He's been to Ohio State three times in the last five weeks. He's expected to visit Michigan again for their game against Ohio State at the end of November. Um, it's a situation where he told me in the summer that it was sort of a Big Ten battle versus an SEC battle, but it wasn't necessarily one school or the other versus one school or the other. It was, do I need to go to the SEC to play big time football? Like that was part of the. Just, you know, that that's sort of the thing that SEC programs and coaches push on kids. Like, this is where you get developed and no one else plays good football. That was before the world started changing when you now have Oregon and Washington and USC and UCLA. Like, the Big Ten is different now, and I think that plays a part in things. Uh, but more than anything, it's just the relationship with Justin Fry and Mike Seleni, their closeness to home, even though Ann Arbor is closer than Columbus to Toledo. But... Uh, I, I do think that the Buckeyes have a fairly significant lead in that recruitment right now. They just need to close it out. Um, they are not going to push and, and and try to 
hurry a, a decision from Carter Lowe, but they have made it very clear to him that he is their absolute priority. Davian and St. Clair very involved, growing that relationship. And Carter has told me that he's thought about maybe shutting things down sooner than than anyone would have thought, but he is not uh, in that mindset yet. Okay, makes sense. Two other things to touch on. Usually I like to ask you just big picture 2024 class stuff here because we're what, about a month and a half away from the early signing period? Uh, so uh, seven weeks, yeah. Yeah, so just big storylines there are watching to see what happens with Jordan Lyle. Obviously, people keep talking about Jeremiah Smith. I don't. Yeah, he's visiting Florida again this weekend. He's visiting Florida State next weekend. Like, it's just going to keep happening. Uh, but again, nothing changing until unless something changes. Right. And then uh, maybe they get Robinson on campus and maybe they try for him. Still fighting off Missouri for Jeremiah McClellan. Larry Johnson's got all kinds of stuff going on. We talked about some of those guys already. Is the Kansas commit, is that just. Does he show up like right now? Not a lot of traction. It doesn't seem like there's been a lot. Yeah, I'd, I've seen multiple places listing him as a player who's expected to visit for the Michigan State game on the 11th. I personally do not expect him to visit for that game. I don't know if maybe he will be there for the Minnesota game the week after, but I kind of doubt it. If he doesn't show up for the night game against Michigan State, I have a tough time seeing it happening for a noon game against Minnesota the week after. So in my mind right now, like that one's sort of flatlined uh the Buckeyes when they offered him I wrote about it initially like I thought it seemed very unlikely with his high school schedule the fact that his desert edge is supposed to make a fairly deep run in the Arizona playoffs like I did not really expect that he would make it to campus at least until December does that mean that he will make it in December I don't know um that kid does a really great job like you will not find a bigger pro Kansas uh football account on the internet than that kid's account. Like everything he tweets is about Kansas. So um, the the one thing I think you circle there is if Lance Leopold leaves the Jayhawks program, which is highly likely, I think, uh, because of the success he's brought there. Now, does that mean that the, uh, Deshaun Warner won't just travel with Lance Leopold? That's another possibility. So I, I think that that recruitment gets more interesting four weeks from now than it is now. But I don't think that Ohio State's really um, make, getting traction there. And again, I do not expect him to visit for the Michigan State game. Um, as of right now. So, uh, but that doesn't mean that there won't, as I said, Amaris Williams will be there. Um, Car, uh, Car, the Jones, the kid they just offered from, from Texas, uh, the Nebraska commit will be there. So, uh, there are certainly some intriguing things happening with Larry Johnson's group, but, um, uh, no, uh, you know, Dominic Kirks, he was just offered by USC, Ohio State still watching, but I don't haven't seen a lot of traction there to suggest that the Buckeyes are ready to offer him either. So uh, it it is weird. It's weird. And little traction on the Torian Nichols front too, unless he Mister randomly decides to show up against yeah. Michigan State. I guess. Yeah, I'm going to put that one on ice right now. Also, I just don't think that's going to happen. I, I, I I'm not sure why, um, but I, I I don't think that there's been enough momentum gained there to suggest that he will show up now i think ohio state with leroy roker with Jalen mcclain at safety still wants one more uh, i think they could still probably look around nationally i don't know where it's going to come from though and and you know there's been some talk about dante carter the vanderbilt commit i don't see that happening um i don't know where the next guy comes from but right now i would not be optimistic on the Terrian nichols front uh, or thinking that he's going to be that guy so maybe just maybe it's a portal move for the yeah I mean there's there's, there's there's things you can look ahead to and um, we're in such a weird time with college football that by one month from now so December first you know when the regular season ends for everyone there'll be twenty different coaches fired and twenty five different coaches in the carousel moving from spot to spot. Things will open up and other options that you maybe didn't think about will will pop. And um, the Buckeyes are not in a position where they're panicking. And that's, I mean, that's always the case, but certainly the case in this new world of college football recruiting. So, um, yeah. Speaking Andrew, what's of your favorite Halloween ca candy? Oh, Reese Cups. Yeah, I was going to get you. I was going to use, I was gonna, you look like a Reese's guy. Thanks. My my favorite candy in general is the Reese cups that have the Reese pieces inside of them. Hmm. You ever had those? Have you tried the ones with the potato chips in them? 
No, I haven't, but I've tried the ones with the pretzels in them. So I'd probably like the ones with the potato chips in them too. I thought that I thought they were jumping the shark when they tried the stuffing them stuff, but it's like legit really good. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You, are you, a black li- like, you black licorice guy or something weird? Uh, lo- no, no. But do you know it's weird that people like black licorice? Um, yeah, I don't get it. Number one, red licorice is so much better. Number two, it tastes gross. Period. Like it's like nasty. candy corn. It's nasty. Why would you eat that? Gross. Yeah, it's terrible. Um, but you alluded to this being strange times in in college football. So of course I'm going to mention this. Not sure if you've heard that Michigan has a uh, situation going on up there. And I know the NCAA oh, more, moves. More. Yeah, there's like a staff member who's been going places and wearing glasses and all kinds of weird stuff. But That's insane. I, I don't think anything. And I think you would agree that nothing is going to happen to their current season unless something absolutely wild comes out. Which at this rate, it could come out by the time people listen to this. There could be. I mean, I don't know, but. If something were to happen and the recruiting class were to not implode, but something, you know, Jim Harbaugh's future is really in jeopardy. Like, is there any could just, you know, if Ohio State could pluck somebody from that class, would a certain running back from the Cincinnati area be the biggest name to potentially watch? I know we're getting ahead of ourselves. I'm just people were asking. I don't know. I think that Michigan has done such a good job of galvanizing their fan base, galvanizing their their team. Um, and I assume the same with the recruits who have all just decided that this is a giant witch hunt. It's all about people hating Jim Harbaugh and being jealous of Michigan men and blah, blah, blah. That like, But once you cross that line as a recruit, especially a recruit from Ohio, like it's kind of hard to come back from that. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't think, even if Jim Harbaugh were to be uh, fired or if he left for the NFL, like, I don't think... I, I I don't mean this in the in the negative way it's going to s- come across, but Michigan arrogance is such that those the people who are a part of that program will say this doesn't matter to us. We're still Michigan men. We will be fine. We will move on, and that's and that's cool. Like I mean that that's how you build a program that lasts for a hundred years, and you you know you build that sort of loyalty and that sort of uh, commitment to the program, but certainly. It doesn't seem to be impacting them right now, but their 2024 recruiting class, all things considered, when you look at where they are as a program and how successful they've been the last three years, however they got to be that successful, notwithstanding, like their 2024 recruiting class is not particularly great or even like good. I mean, it's good. It's good, you know, objectively when you compare it to the national, uh, to everyone else in the country, but like it's not where you think it would be for all the success that they've had. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I think if I was in Ohio state, uh, if I was in the Ohio state recruiting office and Jim Harbaugh got fired, like I would probably go after one or two of their guys, but I don't know that it'd be Marshall because I, I don't think that, I think that line is hard to come back from. Not that he's like disrespectful or, or, you know, been on social media talking a bunch of crap or whatever, but like, it's kind of a weird spot to come back from. But if, if Ohio state lost Jordan Lyle, and Jim Harbaugh was fired, and Michigan's program was on, you know, probation for four years. Maybe, maybe. I mean, it's, it's probably worth a call because Jordan DeMarshall is a great kid, and he's a super talented kid. So, um, you know, maybe it's a chance for everyone to kumbaya it, I guess. But it seems unlikely. I I, I cannot get enough of this scandal. Not just because I'm an Ohio State fan, just because it's like, it's one of those things where it's, you know, it's not like abuse. Nobody's like physically being hurt by it or anything. It's just freaking weird, man. Do you think those uh, images of him on the sidelines were AI generated like some uh, Michigan fans are proclaiming? I do not um, because I saw them on TV. (laughs) So (laughs) unless we've got to a point where, uh, unless we've got to a point where YouTube is allowing videos that are AI generated, like AI edited to be like, I I don't, I mean, I get it. I do. I, and this is the thing, like it, it, as Ohio state fans, we went through in 2011, a, what was clearly felt like a witch hunt at the time, um, for an issue that now 10 years later, 12 years later, people laugh about, like, I cannot believe that Jim Trussell lost his job for what he lost his job for. And, all of the other things, but in Ohio state fans certainly were like on edge about anything like uh, uh, defending anything that happened at the time. But I think that there is a, 
a, a chasm between what that scandal meant and how it impacted the on-field product versus what this one does. And there is no way to compare the two when you're talking about a massive cheating scandal or players getting some money for things that they owned. Like I, I can't, there is no correlation between the two. Um, and I get it. I do get it. Like for Michigan fans who stand there and say, Hey, we didn't do anything wrong. Like I understand the impulse to feel that way. And I know that if, if this was going on on the other side of the rivalry right now, Ohio state fans would make, be making the same, like, sort of ridiculous claims that the Michigan fan base is making, but come on, man. Like if you don't see that this is a big deal, like then you're, then you never played sports. Like if this is, it attacks the heart of everything that competitive athletics is about. And I, I think that, that I think that somehow is being lost in the middle of all this. But the most important question in all this is who hired the private investigator. That's, that's the most yeah. important thing. Like why is that? Uh, it, why does that keep getting brought up? I mean, I I don't know. I'm obviously I'm not because state it's fan. it's just finding a way to put blame on someone else other than your own cheating ass. You know, like that's yeah. the way it goes. Like, uh, yeah. it, it's it's the the husband who cheats on his wife and then gets mad at the wife's best friend who told her. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, you did it. Like, you are the problem here, and uh, the the ability to like deflect or put the blame on someone else just makes you feel better, I guess. But it has nothing to do with the fact that Michigan has clearly been doing this for three years and it directly coincides with their sudden uptick on the field and being a much better program. Like that is a coincidence that is hard to swallow. And I think for Michigan media, who's like, oh, why are Ohio State media so involved? Like there's no program in the country that has been more affected by this obvious cheating than Ohio State has. Like, there's no other program in the country that has had a more direct impact on them than Ohio State has. Like it's changed the entire dynamic of of the rivalry of the Big Ten, uh, the perception that Ohio State is soft, all this stuff that has come as a result of of these things. Like it, it's you can understand why people at Ohio State would take it personally and, and and be upset about it. But I promise people out there, like this is the important thing. There are thir- there are 12 other programs in the Big Ten not named Ohio State or Michigan. Those 12 programs are also pissed. And so for Tony Petiti, the Big Ten commissioner, the new Big Ten commissioner, who was a guy that was the COO of Major League Baseball when the Astro scandal went down, like you have to understand more than anyone that you cannot allow this team to compete for a championship knowing that there is serious doubt cast on whether or not everything they're doing is legitimate. You cannot allow that to happen, period. Cannot. Yeah. So yeah. And- you can look at this and say, oh, well, you know, the NCAA can't do anything till next year. If, if the Big Ten doesn't do something this year, then don't ever do anything about it again and just let everyone cheat because it doesn't matter next year. It matters right now because you've already had two and a half years of walking through your schedule knowing what everyone was going to do ahead of time and if you say, well, we're just going to let this happen for another uh, six months and then we'll deal with it later, that is completely unacceptable. It's completely unacceptable. Yeah. And I, I'm obviously, like you said, I get why Ohio State fans are talking about it so much, but this is on like every single message board for every power program. I mean, this is Michigan. This isn't like, you know, Western Arizona or something like that. This is a team that's been to the playoffs the last two years. And, I, I just can't get enough of it. Like I was busy all day today and didn't, I sat down at seven and had my dinner at, QP hamburgers and Lima and I'm trying to catch up on everything. And like I saw yesterday, the tweet about the sunglasses and this was from an Ohio state fan account. So I just thought, well, that's just an Ohio state fan account. And now I see other people tweeting about it. And like, it legit seems like there might be legs to that, which just blows yeah, my I mean, mind. It's, it's, true. it's a real thing. I mean, clearly it's real. Like central Michigan to deny that they didn't know who it was like is crazy. They have Jim McElwain, their head coach, was coached at Michigan with Connor Stallions when he was a volunteer. Uh, his his, cor- his cornerbacks coach and assistant head coach, uh, Mike Zordich, Michael Zordich, coached at Michigan with Connor Stallions when he was there as a volunteer. Their their quarterbacks coach was on staff at Michigan when Connor Stallions was there. Jim McElwain's son, who worked in the recruiting office at Michigan with Connor Stallions, was at Michigan. He's now at Washington. He's not at Central Michigan. But regardless, like there are way too many ties for Jim McElwain to say, oh, we don't know. And the fact is, when Central Michigan was asked about this initially, they tried to 
point people in other directions and say, oh, no, that's not that's not stallions. That's this guy on our staff until they were proven wrong and saying, oh, look, here's this guy standing next to counter stallions. How is that possible? And now all of a sudden they're investigating it and trying to figure out and get down to the bottom of it. Somebody on Central Michigan staff gave counter stallions their visitors badge. That's the only explanation because Michigan State didn't approve for him to be there. So how did he get into that position wearing a Central Michigan coaching gear? And fake Nikes. I mean, what are we doing? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's just freaking hilarious. Like I said, nobody's being harmed by it. This isn't the Penn State situation or like some terrible abuse scandal. It's just hilarious that it's even happening. And if whether it was the Michigan or somebody else, it would be hilarious. But the fact that it's, you know, happening up north, it's just, I can't, I can't stop following it. Yeah. It's, uh, it is so borderline, like it, it's so bizarre on so many fronts that you can look at it and be like, I can't believe everything that I'm seeing on this stuff. I mean, that video that Josh Pate from CBS Sports 247 posted on Wednesday, where the guy, you see him peeking out behind someone and turning on the recording on his on his sunglasses and the little blue light popping up. Like, are you kidding? It was like, it's one of the funniest video images I've ever seen when you just consider everything that's going on around it. And the fact that there are still Michigan fans, Michigan media members who are trying to obfuscate and say, well, we don't know for sure. Like, it's so, it's so silly. Like, it, we can have semantics arguments about whether or not it should be illegal, whatever. Like, but it is illegal. And we can have arguments about whether or not he acted alone. Or if other people on the staff knew, even though if other people on the staff didn't know, it still doesn't matter. Jim Harbaugh is still responsible for that. Like you can have all those semantic arguments, but like when when it comes down to the basic facts, like that's clearly Connor Stallions on the sideline. Like it's one hundred percent the guy, and you're still now you're coming up. Like you said, oh, it's AI. Oh, it's like what are you doing? Just like accept this part of it, and then we can talk about the minutia or the. Uh, details that that maybe should matter, but like the the thing that the denials and the refusals to uh, accept basic facts are, it, it just blows my mind. Whatever. My, we spent my, more time talking about this than we did recruiting, so I feel bad. But yeah, yeah, no, I w- I was just gonna say my other favorite thing about it is the whole the Michigan fans saying, well, TCU knew about it and they changed their signs and, you know, beat Michigan, Ohio TCU State. You had a month to exactly. You had a month when I think the students were, pr- the, the football players probably didn't even have to go to class because of breaks. And stuff. I don't know. Yeah. I just, I, I don't know. It's just, it's just hilarious. And I hope something new comes out every single day because it's made my life exciting. So, yeah. yeah. They, they had a month to, to learn new signals and you can't really do that in the middle of the football season. Right. Uh, right. When kids are in school and you have whatever but again all those things don't matter like the reality of the situation the the normal like the normal reaction is is not even being heard because people want to so vociferously defend uh something that is borderline indefensible and I, to your point like it isn't the penn state scandal it isn't something that is so like physically Bro, grotesquely yeah. awful that you can't objectively talk about it like this is blatant cheating blatant cheating in the game and for anyone again who's never if you if you haven't played sports maybe i understand why you say well how big of a difference does it make but anybody who's ever played any competitive sport at a at a relatively high level understands if you know what the other guy is doing uh, it, it may not change the outcome like in baseball if i tell you i'm throwing a fastball and you know what's coming. You still have to hit that fastball. You know, I, there's still location. There's still spin rate. There's still velocity. You know, there's still other things that are that are factors in that which make it more difficult. In football, if you know what the other team is doing every single time, maybe you're going to have a 25% advantage on every single play, right? No, sure. Three out of four times, it's not going to matter. But that one time... And at least that one time leads to a touchdown. It matters if that one play out of every four is a a turnover or a third and one stop or a 60 yard pass play to a tight end who's wide open because you knew exactly where that spot was going to be in the field. Like there is no way to suggest that that doesn't make a difference because if it didn't make a difference, they wouldn't be doing it and covering their asses up to do it. Yeah. It's, it's not, it's not super tech mobile where you pick the offensive play and you just, 
completely destroy it. But it's yeah, to act like to act like it doesn't matter is just it's idiotic. But anyway, there's certainly gonna be more to come with that, and it's fascinating, and I can't wait for the game in a little over three weeks, and just lots of fun yeah. stuff going on right now. Yeah, I mean it's uh it's wild, but. Again, sorry, folks, for the little rant there. I know you come to this show for recruiting stuff, but uh, things are relatively calm for Ohio State. Next week, we'll pick up, though, as the Buckeyes get ready to host a, a bunch of visitors for the Michigan State weekend. We'll talk about that more next week on the podcast. But uh, for this episode of Talking Stuff, that's Andrew Ellis. I'm Jeremy Birmingham. If you like the show, please like the show on YouTube. Leave comments, rate, review, subscribe on your podcast uh, feed of choice, whether that's um, Apple or Spotify or whatever you use. We really appreciate it. It helps us with their algorithms and their algorithms are what keep us getting the chance to do this. So uh, once again, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We will see you next time.